And now on Radio Lou, it's time to join Paul Greenwood with some old salty dog tales. Viking, north of the Sierra, south of the Sierra. Forties, chronity, fourth. Time, dogger, fisher. Back in the 1960s, when I was crew on the Lugger Iris, we were pilchard fishing, summertime. We go to sea this night, or evening rather, lovely fine summer's evening, and shoot the nets away, come round head to wind, hoist the mizzen, ship the spars up, roller, ready for, uh, ready for the night's haul. And the skipper was forward, watching points as he called it. And we just got everything shipped up. Some were still above the western horizon. And he says, better shake, better get your oilskins on. We want to shake out these fish. They've hit the boat net and the boys are bobbing. So we uh, had no supper or anything. We <clears throat> got our oilskins on and proceeded with the, with the haul. The engine started. And the fish had hit the net solid. The net came up and we had three of us. Well, one man usually hauls out the rail and the other men behind shake our fish out. And they were so heavy, we had to have the, the head rope, skirt and everything all together. And inch it over the rail, big around as a dustbin is rolled for fish. And get eight to ten feet, uh, feet of it aboard and open up the net and shake them out. And so on. And this carried on and on. We had two mile of nets where we hauled the first mile. Um, but that time we were up to our knees in fish and she was full rail to rail. And the only thing now to do was to what we call board in. You'd uh, just haul the, haul the nets, not bother to shake out more than just what would fall out the, the nets as you hauled. Stow it in the net room, make for harbour, land your deck full of fish and then shake the rest out later on. And uh, which we did. And by the time we got the last net in, the sun was up over the eastern horizon. It was shining again, another new day, and we hadn't stopped. 11 hours we were hauling there. And anyway, we uh, motored in back into Lou, had a quick bite to eat and a cup of tea, uh, get in alongside and land. We were on a limit of 120 stone a boat because the fish had been fairly heavy and the cannery down Newling couldn't cope. So they put us on a limit. So we soon landed, scooped up 120 stone of fish and landed in the cans for the lorry to take it down to Newlin. And uh, then we shoveled the rest over the side. And then we went and had a, had a bit of a break, had a meal and one thing or another. And then rigged the spars and, and, and roll her across and proceeded to shake out. We had a mile of net full up to shake out. So we were back to a deck full of fish again. And we finished about, I don't know, about three o'clock in the afternoon. Tide was back in by then. So we cast off and go out in the bay and just put, put the wheel down so she motored in a big circle and just scooped all the fish overboard again scrubbed up, cleaned up, and this was now about five, six o'clock in the evening. So we've been working 24 hours. And Moogie, the skipper, when we got all cleaned up and everything else, said, well, he said, we just as well go out and shoot the nets again, catch our quota again, all adds up at the end of the week. And we said, no, thank you very much. And with that, he admitted defeat, and we came in and uh, tied up again. But we caught 10 tonne of fish and we'd dumped the lot by 120 stone and we'd been 24 hours working it, which is pretty hard, or hard going. And I think we'd earned about, that was worth about four pound a man. <laughs> but uh, me and Jack Harris had been up sharking the day before and we'd been out pilchard the night before that. So we'd been up about 48 hours. Very tired little teddy bears. Time we uh, 
time I'd gotten turned in. I call this the tale of Jack's hat. Jack Harris, he was one of the crew on the Iris back in the 60s, the old uh, lugger working out of loo. And he got this jaunty little cap, tartan thing, that he used to strut around, cocked on three hairs, and it was doing him no good at all. And his demeanour altered when he was wearing this thing. Anyway, we're out to sea, shot the nets out, all sat round the aft deck in the evening sunshine, enjoying a bite to eat and mug of tea, cigarette, swapping yarns and everything. And to put it politely, Jack the Sunny decided he needed a number two. So uh, toilet facilities in those days on the lug were about 90 foot long, which meant uh, it was the rail, either side port and starboard, wherever you fancied. Stick your bum over it. So Jan off uh, smock and hat, down overalls, and backside over the rail she'd a, she'd a newspaper in hand and you didn't ever in those days you didn't sort of bother to go and hide away anywhere where you were more or less is where you went so he was sat alongside of me but just shuffled out over the rail a bit anyway he was yarning and we were all yarning still and passing comments on his efforts and there was his hat so I took the fags and matches out and thought, hmm, yeah, interesting. And held it out over the rail. And at the right moment, Jackson starts grunting a bit seriously and he lets go a thunderous butt trumpet. And uh, it's away, it's bombs away, dead on target, straight in his hat. Oh my God, he said, that's better. I'm bloody glad to get rid of that. <laughs> and I said, well, there's a Lovely, lovely job you done here, Jack. I reckon you win prizes for that. He said, what do you mean? I said, look, there it is. I showed him his hat, top right up. You dirty bastard, he said. That's my best hat. I said, well, it was, and ditched it overboard. He didn't know what to make of it for a minute, and but eventually he saw the funny side and was laughing until the tears rolled down his face. <laughs> yeah, and that was the end of Jack's hat. He stopped the strutting after that. The fishing was so good I hardly believed it The fish were nearly flying right in I raised me old eyes to distant horizons And I saw them storm clouds rolling in In the Late 60s, early 70s, I was boatswain on the three-masted schooner Malcolm Miller. So, training ship. And uh, our skipper, or what, well, the second skipper I sailed with, never worried about weather, whatever the weather we went. And this particular time we were in uh, one of the North French ports, I can't remember which one it was, we were going to make a run across the channel to, um, to Gosport, our home port. And the forecast was pretty terrible, sort of force tenish. But the skipper had sort of thought, well, you know, timing it is, is not here yet. It won't take us long to cross the channel. Hopefully we'll be in out of it. So uh, away we went. As we were cut passing the uh, one of the pier heads, somebody on the on the end was there with a with a, um, a loudspeaker thing. It says, Captain, force ten for the channel. And the skipper just give him a wave and on we go. Well, we get out clear of the harbour and there wasn't, there's a freshy breeze, but it wasn't bad. So we set 
in a jib, staysail, foresail and mizzen. And off we go, <clears throat> making good progress. But the wind suddenly hit us, just like a flipping sledgehammer, bang, and over we went, tearing along. We were over 45, uh, 50, 60 degrees, pinned down. And with the amateur crew of kids we had, there's no way we could get any sail off her. <clears throat> in fact, you, you couldn't move anyway. You know, the side of it was underwater, the other was up in the air. The bloody spray was breaking across solid. The air was full of water. But every time the sea broke, uh, the, the wind picked the spray up and carried it. So it was just full of water, full of spray. And uh, the kids were batten down below basically me and the engineer took an hour hour about steering the mate and the watch officer took us took another at the other hour and we carried on like this and a couple of other watch officers took the lookouts and the old man was navigating and um, we just pray and everything held <coughs> um ty was carrying us up channel a bit um and the skipper said to the engineer can you start one of the engines you two engines and a generator and uh, he wanted juice as well so engineer managed to get down the engine room and came up and couldn't start anything we were over too far and the, and the engines couldn't get their oil so that was that we were <laughs> pure sailing vessel so on we carried everything held but it was one hell of a bloody trip across and the water was pouring down the companionways fore and aft because they were just wooden ones. And the fore deck, or the the, um, uh, the half deck, as they called it, where the con uh, where the trainees lived, was just a wash. You know, the water was coming down the companionway like a like Niagara Falls. And the deck was a wash of just swilling with clothes and crockery and. Uh, spew and, and, and everything back and forth and swilling about two foot deep and our uh, our PO's mess back half was about three foot deep till we, till we made land or got into shelter we didn't reach port of Gosport we got into an anchorage off um, Brighton eventually sailed in luffed up down anchors down foresail and everything I was in charge of the mizzen with a gang we got the kids up on deck by this time lower away the mizzen and the top half or top third of it was just gone blown away it was a great big um, Bermudan mizzen and all the roach the curve at the top had just gone all we had left was a rope in and it was a heavy sail too 15 layers thick luff and leech with big ash buttons stiffening it up, but it, it had all gone. So we uh, snugged everything down and pumped her out and made everything as best we could and turned in for a few hours. The next morning set to to square her up a bit and then we motored down and um, dial her white and put the sails ashore because they were all badly strained, the ones we'd had set, and the mizzen needed rebuilding. So we had to bend on a whole new load of sails, and uh, <laughs> the old man didn't uh, never worried about weather, but that was very near his nemesis. Mm -hmm.